on Mail Out 10, the final instalment and the reveal of this year's mystery blanket. I am so excited about this and I really hope that you are too. So my introduction today um, with this video is really centres on the design and the inspiration um, and creation of the mystery blanket. In the written blog you'll find um, lots of help and advice for the final squares and the finishing of your blanket plus lots of other things, um, updates on, on my kit launches, um, some lovely final member, member stories for this year um, amongst lots of other bits and pieces to um, have a good read through. This video will focus on the inspiration um, for the design. I'm going to reveal now, if you haven't already guessed it, the title of this year's mystery blanket. The title is 1001 Nights. So the inspiration for this design um, came from uh, the reading the book here, 1001 Nights, which I read cover to cover. I'd already in 2009, some of you may well remember, and you may have been members of that club, um, I did the Arabian Nights blanket. So this is following along the, the same theme. Um, I felt, with, felt that with the 2009 mystery blanket, um, it was unfinished business. Um, there was so much design inspiration and I had so many ideas left over from that blanket which never actually um, uh, got put into it, I thought, right, there's enough here for me to do a second blanket. And it was such a popular blanket, such a popular theme, um, that I decided to re revisit it for this year's blanket. So 1001 Nights is a collection of stories um, told by Sharazad, I hope I've said that correctly, um, who, is a, who is under sentence of death to um, her husband, King Sharia. Now, the book is full of mischief and um, fantasy. It's sort of violent glory. There is lots of drama. Um, it's quite dark in places, but at the same time, it's quite humorous and quite witty too. So all these sort of fabulous stories, um, which I had a good read through, um, I wanted to try and, and put that energy um, and those ideas into the blanket design. So as with all my designs, the beginning of the design process begins with gathering together visuals and ideas. So I already had the book here um, with sort of so, so inspiration from a, a written source, but I needed visuals um, to sort of stimulate and help me create the colour palette and the designs for the squares. So um, I collected together postcards and images um, I found in magazines and on the internet and created um, a board of, of patterns and colour um, that would be constantly referred to during the design process to inspire the design. So I collected visuals of all sorts of different things connected with the theme of 1001 Nights. So um, I focus a lot on sort of sari fabrics um, with, with lots of um, braids and brocades and, and lots of very, very rich colours. Um, that was sort of super inspiration, especially for the colour palette. And then I also um, looked at Islamic geometric design, which I had this found this wonderful book in um, Waterstones, which is just absolutely brimming with vis visual imagery. Um, and what it does is it, it looks at um, lots of different um, pieces of architecture in the Islamic world. And then what it does is it simplifies um, those shapes and those motifs into sort of simple geometric patterns. And this was a Brilliant source of inspiration. I used it a lot, especially for the Fair Isle designs, which I will talk about a little bit later on. So after I'd chosen my inspiration and got my visuals together, uh, the next step in the process was to create the colour palette and to select yarns for the project. As you can sort of see from um, the inspiration that fueled this design, um, I needed a very, very bright colour palette, very bold, vibrant colours. I use Rowan for my mystery blanket. And when I looked at the colour palette, um, bearing in mind that I really need to go for about a double knitting weight um, for a good 
blanket um, yarn. I found the the offer of bright colours very limited. Um, so I approached Rowan and asked if they would work with me on a bespoke yarn for the project. And um, hence then came about the Merino Light DK uh, into which I could put any colours I wanted. So it was, as a designer, it was brilliant because I could um, just give them the colour palette that I wanted and they gave me those colours for the design. And so that, that was brilliant um, from my point of view because I got that very bright colour palette that was so important to the design. I, it was also important that the yarn I selected was going to um, work well with another yarn from the Rhone range for fair old patterns um, and it was felted tweed that I wanted to use. Um, some of K Facet's fabulous really bright colours um, were what I chose for the project to mix with the Merino Light DK. Those two yarns, when I was sampling, um, I found that they worked so well together and really knitted up beautifully, uh, especially together in the fair old patterns. Um, I also added in some Alpaca Soft DK, which is a fabulous soft yarn. One of my favourites in the Rowan collection at the moment. I absolutely adore this yarn and, and I'm using it more and more in my designs. So I chose a, a I think, two, one or two colours from that. I think it was one colour, um, the, the, the wine. Um, and I also then mixed it with a little bit of soft yak, which is another big favourite of mine. And uh, I mixed it with the jaune, that lovely bright yellow. So the next step after sorting my inspiration, getting my colour palette and my yarns together, um, the next uh, step for me was to create a, a colour layout so I could see where the colours were planned to be placed and the pattern work too, um, all subject to change because this is at the very this was at the very start of the design and as I as I design um, my ideas do sometimes change. Um, in fact, I think in every blanket I've designed, I have a very uh, I have a very um, focused idea of what I want it to be like at the beginning. But by the time I get to the end of the design, um, some elements of it have changed and, and sort of progressed and developed um, as the design has sort of grown. Um, so uh, my colour layout is, is for me to plan where the colours are going to go and for me to work out how much yarn I'm going to need in each colour um, for this blanket. So um, that's my very first step. Very early on in the design, I decided that I wanted to create um, a, a, a perimeter around the edge of the blanket, which um, are made up of all those King's Palace squares. Now, I know for a lot of you, um, I know they got quite repetitive because there are a lot of them, but I I felt that this, this was what I wanted around the border. I wanted this very definite kind of border with the zigzags. Um, beaded zigzags and the stripes. Um, there is a change of colour. Um, there's two colourways in each of the two um, King's Palace squares. Um, and then you've got your sumptuous squares in the corners um, too. I took a lot of time <laughs> at the beginning drawing out um, the whole edge, the whole perimeter edge and making sure that when the squares were joined together, bearing in mind that a, a, a stitch at each side would be taken into seam allowance on each of the squares. Um, I took a lot, lot of time making sure that the beaded pattern would would match up so it ran continuously along each edge. Um, and if you've managed to um, mattress stitch those squares together exactly, you should find that that pattern runs beautifully all around the perimeter of the blanket. It was also quite a big decision to um, position the some of those King's Palace squares on their side. Um, it's something I haven't done in a blanket before and I'm always very nervous about doing something brand new in a blanket, particularly with how the squares are, are sewn in or, or the stitches are picked up. But I decided that this was the right thing to do because I wanted those squares to be exactly the same all the way around the perimeter, rather than um, knitting them all bottom to top. And then the, the squares on the, on the sides would have looked slightly different to the ones top and bottom. So that was my reason for that. And actually when I sampled it up, I found that it, it wasn't a problem at all. The, the squares turned on their side, could be picked up where necessary um, that happens I think in the in the center of the blanket on those side edges you just sew the squares together selvage to selvage and it and it seemed to work okay 
So hopefully it didn't create too much of a problem for, for anybody. So on my design um, layout, um, when I'm planning out the patterns, um, I'm thinking about um, the squares and the direction that the knitting and the, the patterns are going. So for example, I'm thinking about um, uh, horizontal patterns, I'm thinking about vertical patterns, and I'm thinking about sort of all over patterns, um, somewhere where squares, for example, like um, the king's robes, where it's just an all over beaded pattern. Um, and, and the placement of these squares is really, really important in the design to make sure that it's balanced, i.e. that I haven't got um, several horizontal patterns all next door to each other, or several uh, vertical patterns all next door to each other, that the, the balance in the design is, is right and that they are placed where they look pleasing in the design and where they work together. Um, so if you look at the design, you should find that they're, they're really maybe in the option two, but definitely in option one, there's nowhere where you've got two horizontal patterns that are next door to each other as you go across the blanket. There's the squares that I had in mind to design. I, I always have stripes in my design because they're wonderful. I love love stripes um, all over patterns, such as the beaded one, King's Palace that I've just um, mentioned. Then I wanted some fair isles in there. I wanted some textured cable stitches. I had a plan in the centre right from the beginning for option one to have the intarsia, um, that focal point with the souk and the bazaar squares in the um, centre. So they were going to always be in Tarsia for option one. Beads and shisha mirrors, um, which I just thought beads, of course, I have beads in all my designs um, or just about. And shisha mirrors were just so in keeping with this whole theme, this whole sort of Arabian theme. Frills and braids, um, which I've I have done some sort of similar um, stitch work like that in, pre in other projects, um, but I thought it was just perfect um, to use in 1001 Nights. Just thinking about the colour placement, um, I think coral, that bright orange, is the most vibrant of the shades in the whole of the blanket. So I was very careful where I placed that. Um, and it, it, if you look at the blanket, there's little, little scatterings of it, um, sort of as you get into the centre, there's that great bold blast of, of coral in the middle there both for both options. So it's sort of, you're gently introduced to it before it kind of explodes in the middle of the design. Okay, so let's take a look at um, some of the um, individual squares in the design and I'm going to talk a little bit about them and just point out a few things and, and about their, talk about their inspiration too. Um, so first I'm going to focus on um, the sumptuous and bedecked squares which are a horizontal pattern so they're in the horizontal um, group of patterns if you like and the inspiration for these came from sari fabrics and all those wonderful sort of piles of Indian fabrics that you see in the marketplaces so it was really important that these squares were highly decorative um, and for both of these squares I use that kind of braiding idea where you knit the braid separately and then you knit them in um, and then they they each had a kind of a, a beaded row or a slip stitch row on the bedeck just above the braiding um, just to to make it even more kind of rich looking and more vibrant. Um, I use the sumptuous squares in the four corners of the design and then the bedeck squares are set more centrally um, placed very carefully so that they're, they're very evenly balanced. Um, there's very slight colour changes um, in both of these squares. So sumptuous kind of the colours swap about from corner to corner. Um, in, and in bedecked, uh, I think it's the garnet is swapped with turquoise just to give it a slightly different look. Um, I'm, I normally make quite slight colour changes, not, not massive colour changes, so that the squares visually... Um, they do look slightly different, but they don't look disjointed. Um, I think there's a lot of colour. There's a lot of different pattern, pattern work in this blanket. And I, and I wanted it to be very vibrant and very colourful. But at the same time, I didn't want it to look disjointed. So that's where the repetition of some of these squares um, helps the whole design kind of balance and, and hold together. Magic Carpet um, is the is the fair old design for option one and it's um i tried to simulate a kind of fair old looking pattern in option in the option two design for this square um which is is actually just a kind of a, a striped moss stitch 
um, as an alternative to the ferrule technique. Uh, the design for the option one came directly from this wonderful um, Islamic geometric book. It's I was very keen to use sort of authentic patterns and then to adapt them and, and make them work in a feral design. Um, so there are two magic carpet squares for option one. Um, again, they look quite similar. You know, you look at the blanket quickly and you might think it's the same square in those four um, places in the blanket, but actually there are two different designs there. Um, but again, to 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 hold the design together so it didn't look too disjointed, I used the same basic design. I just changed the, the patterning for the ferrule. So the same colours, that little spot, bright spot of coral in there, um, just giving it a bit of a zing um, with that dark um, tanzanite and electric green, bright electric green used in the ferrule. Um, so I, I feel they have a very sort of dark, mysterious kind of look. Um, and hopefully the, the patterning on it was um, looks like some magic carpet that, um, you know, uh, some of the characters in the book were flying about on in their in their wonderful stories. In the set of sort of vertical patterns, um, I suppose the most dominant one um, is the is Lady Zubida, the um, cable design. Um, there are very few vertical patterns in option one. In option two, you've got the cables in your six squares, which um, for squares that are sitting, I think it must be ooh, at square 24 and 26, if I've got that right, um, they, they create a, 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 a vertical pattern. Um, on the other squares, the other side, obviously they're going horizontally. Lady Zubida is, is repeated four times in the design. Um, the cable remains the same, but the, there's, a, there's a change in the colour of beads there. And I really wanted to go for a cable that was twisting and turning all over the place because that's what the stories do in the book. Lots of twists and turns, um, creating all this kind of um, mystery um, in, the, in the book. And that's what I, I, I thought, right, if I, if I just have a straightforward cable, just going cable front, cable front all the time. Um, it, it's not sympathetic to this idea of mystery and intrigue. So um, I was trying my best through a cable design to bring through this idea of lots of in, entanglements of all these different stories. In the patterns that I would put in, if you like, the all over um, section, uh, first one I'm going to talk about is plush, which is the um, option, an option one square. Um, in the option two, it was actually changed into a horizontal stripe. Um, but for option one, it is that all over ferrule with that bright sulphur, um, just, I think, the most superb colour in um, Cave's wonderful colour for felted tweed. Um, I had to get that in their design, in, into the design. I thought it was just wonderful. I, I played about with quite a few different um, all over ferrule designs for this square and finally um, decided to go with this one, which I've done in two slight different colours. So you've got the sulphur in the background for both of them, um, that little um, bright spark of turquoise going across, but then the um, canard in the Kid Classic and uh, I believe it's the wine, um, they swap positions. So subtle changes yet again, but just, just enough, just to give it that little bit of extra interest with those um, slight colour changes. The second all over um, pattern I want to talk about is the um, King's Robes. Um, so in the story, um, it, 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 there's mentions of the King's Robes and these wonderful, um, very opulent, very rich fabrics that he's that he's dressed in. Um, so I wanted to um, create a square all about his these wonderful um, decorative robes. Um, so I went for uh, this kind of all over um, beaded design with those, um, dare I say, and I always get the number wrong, I think it, I think it could be 24 um, small circles that you had to embroider on. And I know some of you found these quite difficult to do, but after after some practice, hopefully they, they uh, you got quite good with them. I actually um, didn't mind doing them at all. It's all part of the process. And I felt that that embroidery is really, really important in those squares. Um, I know some of you have left them off and the square still looks stunning, actually. Still, still looks good. But that extra embroidery just sort of heightens this feel of sort of 
decoration and, and um, this very um, rich feel that I wanted these King's Robes fabrics to have. So that brings me now um, to the centre panel of the blanket and um, the squares that I called um, Souk and Back to the Souk and the Bazaar. Different options here, two different options you could have worked on. Um, very early on for option one, I had decided to go for this very geometric um, pattern in the centre. I knew I wanted triangle triangles. Um, I knew I wanted shisha mirrors and beads and plenty of colour. I wanted to try and bring all the colours in that I could from the um, from the blanket to make it this very vibrant focal point. Option one, square twenty five. Um, I went through so many different options for this. I knitted all sorts of different options playing with lots of geometric shapes, playing with um, triangles, playing with squares, playing with circles too. In fact, I had decided to go for a circular shape and then at the last minute I changed my mind and went for the concentric squares, which I feel were the best um, option for this centre square out of all the ones that I'd been working on. For option one, you've got those four triangles, um, very, very geometric, um, a li few little cables there, which then um, the cables then relate back really to those Lady Zubida squares, which surround, um, which are around that centre um, section. Um, option one, um, here we go, here's the square here on its own, my sample, uh, correct way up. Um, option one really drew from lots of patterns um, in the blanket. So you've got here, this um, stripe here is actually taken from the Bedeck square and then these stripes here are taken from the uh, King's Palace squares and then you've got the um, embroidery here that relates back to the King's robe. So it was really important for me for, for both options one and two that it kind of drew in some ideas and the colours from everything that was surrounding those squares in the in the blanket to make this kind of really bold statement in the middle um so uh yeah so that that's the center which um i don't know if anybody guessed what it was going to be um probably guessed that it was going to be something very very sort of geometric but uh no uh it was uh it was important to me that it was a bit of a wow factor in the middle so hopefully that's achieved through uh all that 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 very uh busy um, nature of those squares. They're very busy, they're very decorative, they're very colourful and uh, they hopefully draw your eye right into the centre of the design. Finally then, the edging. Um, now, I'm just hoping that not too many of you uh, went into meltdown when you saw all those bobbles. I think there's 252 bobbles in option one. Um, I thought long and hard about this edging and I decided in the end that um, bobbles were really really important they just related so much to the to the theme and um, I could bring in um, lots of colour through having multicolour bobbles if you haven't already done the edging and you probably haven't actually because we're only on on at the very beginning um, of mail out 10 don't despair. They are actually, once you get going, I found them really quite enjoyable to do. They take time, uh, but I, I really enjoyed the process. Um, if you don't want to do bobbles, you can do the option one, which is garter stitch with a little slip stitch section in it. Far easier, far quicker to do. Um, but I'm going to leave that. Obviously, that, that decision is up to you what you're going to um, do for the edging. The edging is really, really important. And I always leave my decision about what I'm going to do to the very end of the project. The reason being is that I I have to design the whole blanket and then the edging is what kind of brings it all together and kind of concludes it. Um, and the colour selection and, and what pattern I'm using for the edging is really sort of important um, because it has to tie all the, if you like, all the loose ends up. It has to um, be the, 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 it's the final part that you do. It has to draw everything together. So that brings me to the end of um, the 2021 Mystery Blanket and um, hopefully uh, you've enjoyed listening to how the design came about and um, the, the design process behind it, which is a very, very, very long process, but a hugely enjoyable one. And I really do hope that you enjoyed knitting up 
your mystery blanket this year few notices before I sign off then um, and say goodbye for this year. Um, there are some slight changes to our forthcoming kit launches. You can read um, the, the, about those dates, those changes of dates in the written blog. Um, mystery boxes we've just um, launched but there's a few Christmas bits and pieces and the lavish cushion um, which be, will be launched a week or two later than what I originally said. Apologies for that but um, I've just had such a huge workload um, recently, lots going on in my life so um, there's just a slight delay but they will be in the shop soon and we will let you know as soon as they are there. If you have worked on any Debbie projects this year, mystery, not just mystery projects but any of my kits please do send in um, any pictures and stories you have about your projects um, and with your permission I would love to include them in our members gallery um, I do this every year it's a it's a brilliant way for all you wonderful knitters to show off what you've achieved um, during the past year um, so do send them in send them in to me at debbie at debbieabrahams.com with a few words if you can and um, I will put the members gallery live on my website in January so it's something to look forward to in the new year. Okay so now it's time for me to say goodbye and to say thank you, thank you so so much for being the most wonderful Mystery Blanket members. Um, I, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed um, knitting up the blanket. Um, hopefully it's been a lot of fun and you've learned maybe a few new techniques along the way. And we still have some places left for 2022 and um, the design of which I'm, I'm working on um, at the moment. Um, we're already oh, uh, in November so um, we'll be getting up the parcels um, ready very very soon to um, mail out to you all. If you haven't signed up already you can pop along to the online shop and get your self signed up um, as long as memberships are still available they are as far as I know at the moment so it would be great to see you again next year if you do decide to join me um, I'll be doing all the videos and um, writing a monthly blog as I've done this year so um, I feel like I get to see you um, and uh, certainly you you have a chance to uh, to meet with me every month and uh, to uh, get lots of help with your squares I'm going to wish you all um, dare I say it, a peaceful and happy festive season. We're only in November, but my goodness, it's going to go fast. So um, I wish you um, happy knitting, keep busy, please keep safe and well, um, and all being good, um, I will see you back here in my workroom in front of all my beads in February next year. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.